Uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Lawrence Cohen, and I'm the director of the Institute for South Asia Studies. The Maharaj Call Annual Lectureship and Memorial Fund was established by the family of the late Maharaj Call, and I'm very grateful that his brother um, and his nephew and niece are here today. I thank them for this gift. Uh, Maharaj Call was an inspirational activist and UC Berkeley alumnus who brought people <coughs> together to create change, who cultivated community expected and unexpected, and who nurtured and sustained the legacy of a California-based South Asian critical practice and radical commitment. My predecessor here, Professor Rakarai, brought her own close collaboration with Maharaj Kaul into the design with Maharaj Kaul's family of a lecture series that reflected and extended his vision and a scholarship program enabling student research and conference travel. Student awardees this past year of the scholarships work on topics <coughs> ranging from residential segregation and discrimination in Delhi housing markets to heat exposure amongst traffic workers in Ahmedabad to the Sakalasaki Rural Women's Empowerment Program. This year marks the fifth annual Maharaj Call Lectureship. Previous lecturers had been the journalist P. Sainat, right to information activist Arna Roy, Secretary of the All India <coughs> Progressive Women's Association Kavita Krishnan, and filmmaker Hansal Mehta. The 2016 Maharaj Call Lecturer is Dr. Lawrence Lang, a lawyer, activist, scholar, public intellectual, artist, and filmmaker. Dr. Liang is perhaps best known as the co-founder of the Alternate Law Forum based in the city of Bangalore. In his own words, the ALF is, quote, a nonprofit collective that works in various aspects of law, legality, and power, providing legal services to various marginalized groups, focusing on access to the criminal justice system, and issues of gender, disability, and sexuality. This description does not begin to do justice to the scope of the ALF or of Dr. Liang. He was up late last night, as I have a sense most nights, advising legal cases in India and long-term strategy in issues ranging across his career from free speech to sexual and communal violence, from anti-minority discrimination to intellectual and creative property, the last one of many areas of his incredibly innovative and powerful thinking as a scholar working at the multiple intersections of law, media, property, film, and sex and gender. Lawrence, and I will be informal on this formal occasion as I have some minimal right to the name, <laughs> <laughs> began his intellectual career studying English literature at St. Joseph's College, Bangalore, and then went on to receive both the BA and LLB degrees for the National Law uh, School of India University. He received his LLM in Law and Development, University of Warwick. With each of these degrees, he gets lots of awards as well. <laughs> um, and he received his PhD in Film Studies at a great university that has been much in the news, the Jawaharlal Nehru University, or JNU, which, given the title of his Maharaj Call Lecture, may I imagine come up this evening. He has received a number of prestigious awards and visiting lectureships, including in this country, visiting positions at Columbia University and the University of Michigan. He left the Alternate Law Forum this past year, and despite the uh, illusion of freedom this might suggest, currently divides his time amongst an extraordinary array of commitments. Lawrence is the author of the 2007 book The Public is Watching, Sex, Laws, and Videotape. His eagerly awaited, about to be published, magnum opus, The Cinematic Justice, The Law in and of Films in India. He is, everything else I've noted aside, amongst the most original film theorists writing today. His articles comprise his many fields, from law as in freedom of speech and expression in India in the new Oxford Handbook of Constitutional Law in India, and Piracy, Temporality, and the Question of Asia in the Indian Journal of Intellectual Property Law, to intellectual property uh, in a broader conceptual terrain, as in many, many articles, including Pirate Aesthetics, and The Ghost in the Machine, Legal Capture of Technology, the latter in one of the many famed Sarai readers that he has contributed to or edited. And this is a pathetic hinting at his range. One of my favorite Liang works are Media's Law from Representation to Affect, and especially A Brief History of the Internet from the 15th to the 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence has taught so many of us to think 
and to think about how, for example, film moves from the screen to the street through the copy, and demands a radical rethinking of the spatiality of cinema and the question of representation. He has taught us how the invention of the camera surprises the modern law in its romantic conception of authorship. He has taught us to rethink censorship from a vertical problem of the repressive state uh, to and extending to a horizontal problem, as in Dudanath Batra's attack recently on Wendy Doniger. Uh, he has taught us, and here I would cite the example of Maharaj Kal, as I've learned of his legacy from his family and from Raka and many others, to be brilliant and fearless. Um, it is a great honor to have him here. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for that introduction. Um, I was very tempted to say, you know, thank you all of you, and now we can go to the Wendy Brown lecture. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really an honor to be here uh, and to deliver the Maharaj Call Memorial Lecture for a number of reasons. In many ways, I think of myself in a way, uh, although I never met, <coughs> you know, Maharaj Call, as having some kind of an affinity, uh, as reflecting in some ways a lot of the core concerns that we've had for a number of years at the Alternative Law Forum and working with other organizations and, and, and movements in India, where a rich legacy of his work that needs to be recalled, particularly in the times that we live in. And I think that one of the kind of exemplary things that he did was to forge a conversation between activism here locally as well as what was happening in India. And I think that this is something that we really need to carry with us. Uh, P. Sainath, I think the first memorial lecturer, uh, described him as a gentle radical. And I think one of the things that I'd really th like to think about in today's talk is the idea of what it may mean to recall the virtues of gentleness in a time when public life seems to be dominated in a way by strident discord. The current political environment, both in the US and in India, bear many similarities. Uh, and I think that it's important to also mark in a way a certain kind of an affinity between UC Berkeley and JNU. When I was coming here, someone described Berkeley to me, it's my first visit, as, oh, you will feel totally at home because it's the JNU of the US. <laughs> so, so I was a little disappointed to not find too many kurta-clad jola types <laughs> over here. Uh, <coughs> but if you, for those of you who are not familiar with what's been happening, a very quick recap since that's going to form, in a way, some of the conceptual questions that I'll pose in today's talk. Uh, <coughs> The president of the Students' Union, along with four other people, four other students, were charged with sedition, uh, with no basis in the law whatsoever. But really what has happened is that the, from the moment that they were arrested, the president was arrested, a very divisive, a very sharply divisive kind of public discourse around nationalism and anti-nationalism has in a way taken over you know, uh, all conversations in media and elsewhere in the country. And I think it reminds me in a way of the situation in the US in the post 9-11 context, where a similar kind of a you know, sharp divisiveness happened here, with one crucial difference. That 9-11 was an event. Something had happened. You know, in a way, a kind of a traumatic event that allows for a certain kind of an easy mobilization around you know, extremely strong, passionate nationalist sentiment. In the case of JNU, it seems to me that there was nothing that actually happened. So we're looking in a way at a certain kind of a recalibration because what seems to have really happened is a war declared by the media. And I'm interested in trying to use that as a base for thinking about some of the things that I, I want to talk about. But despite the differences between the two events, there are also a number of similarities, which is the same kind of assault on intellectuals, on academics, the same name calling of people as anti-national and as traitors. So even as we speak at the moment, there is a concerted attack against Pro Professor Nivedita Menon, uh, one of the editors of, of the multi-contributor blog Kafila, as well as a teacher to many of us uh, from JNU. And a concerted attempt to attack her, police complaints have been filed in different parts of the country. And I think it's important, therefore, in that context, remembering the Maharaj called legacy, to look at how we can actually continue to work with each other. Uh, because I think what we are really facing here is a problem of a global proportion. It's not merely an Indian problem or a US pro problem. The global rise of the right, marked by very similar characteristics in the way that they you know, go about their business, uh, requires forms of solidarity, both intellectual and political, that will need to be forged. And I think these are the equations that we can actually start you know, building these things. 
I'm also very happy to be in Berkeley for another reason. This is the site of one of my great heroes, uh, Mario Savio. Uh, and so, you know, going to the free speech um, cafe, going to the People's Park and looking at the mural, etc., has been hugely inspiring. And I can't think of a better place to talk about sedition than Ber Berkeley. So <laughs> thanks for you know, inviting me. My title, <coughs> as you can see, It's All About Loving Your Nation, is actually a borrowed title. And it's a riff from a movie uh, called Kabhi Khushi Kabhi Gum, which was all about loving your parents. <coughs> For those of you not familiar with this movie, this is a Karan Johar film. And Kar Karan Johar films are marked in a way by their ornate surplus, right? So it's also marked by another thing, which is Karan Johar films are about the staging of an impossible love. All his movies are about presenting an ideal picture of the heteronormative family, uh, which he can never actually give his parents. So this ornate, you know, kind of love, uh, <clears throat> but also an impossible one, for me is actually an interesting entry uh, into the question of nationalism and sedition. But the film itself provides us with a very, very interesting entry point into the question of sedition and of you know, uh, any insults to national symbols. So in 2002, when the movie came out, many of us went to watch the film. And there is a moment in the film, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, where <coughs> Shah Rukh and Kajol's son being brought up in London uh, <coughs> as, you know, as a regular kind of a London child, there's a fear that he's going to be anglicized and he's forgetting his uh, culture. And there's a school program for which he's practicing where his mother feels that he's going to sing a rap song. So they go for the program and they start sing he starts singing and it turns out that he's singing the national anthem. So in the film, the family immediately gets up and very slowly, the other members of the, aud uh, the audience of the song also slowly get up. <laughs> But I recall going for this movie and a moment of a certain kind of a dilemma when the scene was played. There were a couple of students who were sitting behind me who suddenly started whispering saying, shouldn't we be getting up, it's the national anthem. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other one says, yeah, but if we are the only ones who stand up, it'll look very silly. So there was this kind of moment of a, of a you know, kind of a crisis that had precipitated. <laughs> In Bhopal, a gentleman <coughs> called Sham Narayan Choksi also went to watch the film. And Sham Narayan Choksi was the founder of an organization called Jeevan Jagrati Prayas, an uh, uh, organization for the promotion of national temper and the inculcation of national spirit amongst people. So when the national anthem started playing, he immediately got up. But he was very distressed to find that no one else did. So he urged people around him to get up, yeah. uh, but they didn't. Yeah. So he then, after the movie, went to the management and said that, listen, you know, when the national anthem plays, there should be some instruction that you give before the film so that everyone should get up. The management says, no, this will create a law and order problem, so they don't do it. So he, on his own uh, expense, then prints pamphlets and stands outside the theatre giving it to everyone who comes, informing them that at some point of time in the film, the national anthem will be played and everyone should stand up. Uh, but people then shoo him away because they're giving a, he's giving away the surprise in the film. <laughs> so he goes to the police commissioner and says that you should enforce this. The police commissioner promises him that he'll do something about it, uh, but then proceeds to do absolutely nothing about it. So like any agitated uh, good citizen, he files a public interest litigation <laughs> in, the, in the Madhya Pradesh High Court. Uh, on the grounds that this is a violation of the Prevention of Insults to the National Honours Act 1971. When the matter comes up before the court, something really interesting happens. And as someone who's interested in the intersection between law and cinema, this for me was a perfect coming together of the two. Because the judges in the case framed the legal question in the following manner. They ask, who is the audience of the national anthem? Is it the people in the film, or is it the people watching the film? And what is the relationship between the people in the film and the people watching the film? Because if you go by the logic that it's the people in the film, then he says, well, all of them stood up, right? <laughs> but then they claim, but the petitioner then claims that, yes, but they didn't all stand up at the same time. <laughs> to which the defense argues, but well, not all of them knew it was a national anthem. So the moment the uh, non-Indian citizens, for example, found out, they also stood up. But really fascinating manner in which fundamental questions of film theory, of the relationship between the spectator and the screen, suddenly became, in a way, a legal question. Now, 
In this particular case, the outcome was a bit strange because having gone through the entire argument, the courts arrived at the conclusion that A, the national anthem had been used by way of being an item number and hence was invalid. <laughs> and oh. second, that it was a commercial use of the national anthem. And so they proceeded to grant an injunction against the film. <laughs> but Karan, Karan Johar, of course, being Karan Johar, managed to obtain uh, <coughs> an, an order from the Supreme Court invalidating the injunction <laughs> the very next day. <laughs> but in addition to the legal arguments, what I found really interesting, and this is the, the, the thing that I will focus on today, is that you will find in this judgment a very fascinating added dimension, the extra legal dimension, where the judge uses the case as an opportunity to hold forth on the nature and purpose of the national anthem, on national symbols, on duties and responsibilities to national symbols, etc. And this form of the surplus that has really nothing to do with the legal case, but has a very strong putative value because it forms, in a way, the moral backbone of the case, even though it has no legal validity, is for me what is really interesting in how it speaks to a certain kind of a crisis that I see of the contemporary. And let me quote from paragraph 22 of the judgment, and you'll find that uh, the judge is particularly fond of Latin maxims. <coughs> the national anthem is to be sung with magna cum laude, and nobody can ostracize <laughs> the concept of summa cum laude. In the case at hand, as we have noted earlier, the son of the protagonist sings the national anthem as a surprise item. The presentation, according to us, is in media res. The child actor forgets the line and utters the term sorry. To some, it may appear lapsus lingui, or a natural forgetting. But if the whole thing is perceived and understood and appreciated in the complete scenario, it is the scriptwriter's fertile imagination and the director's id est. It is a deliberate slip of the pen. It is because there is, in a way, a deliberation to project a dramatic effort to show that the scene depicted in the film is on an absolute terra firma. <laughs> they, have not, they, have, they have not kept in mind Bo Populi, Bo Dai. <laughs> the producer and director have allowed the national anthem, the alpha and omega of the country, to the back <laughs> uh, In addition to his rather impressive list of ma Latin maxims, I'm very tempted to add recipes are locator, or let the evidence speak for itself. <laughs> But if the judgment is not a deliberate slip of the pen, then we're in some fair amount of trouble. This lapsus lingue of the judicial decision is one way, I would suggest, of thinking about the surplus, in a way, of legal deliberations. How are we to understand this extraordinary surplus that characterizes many legal orders and judgments, as we shall see in the bail order in the Kanhaya Kumar case? Mm -hmm. On the one hand, one could say that they're merely instances of an over-enthusiastic judge passing observations at large, which have very little to do with legal questions. And this is relatively common in the form of court judgments in India. But I would suggest that while it is generally true, these observations are also symptomatic of something else. And collectively, for me, they constitute, in a way, an archive of a judicial populism, which needs to be read not merely within the terms of the law, but in conversation with other political and cultural histories and developments. In my talk today, I will try to outline the ways in which we can see an overlap between popular media, especially a belligerent news channel, uh, and the legal system. But the mimetic relationship between the two is what I'm interested in. Because legal events also circulate within the spectacular economy of the media. They're both constituted by and compete with forms of public address that media deploys. Our current media moment inaugurates for me a new kind of judicial populism with extremely serious consequences for how we think about procedure, the rule of law, and justice. The surplus of these judgments, I argue, can be read as a mode of public address since they become the operative rhetoric of what is reported and discussed in the media. The petitioner in the K3G case, Shandaran Choksi, is in many ways a representative figure of a form of activism which has gained importance in the recent years an easily hurt citizen ever ready to take legal or vigilante action. These activists usually trade in the currency of indignation and moral agitation. Claiming to represent the sentiments of the people at large, they have mastered the heckler's weapons of disruption, relying either on stones, the law, or often both to enforce their indignation. But the K3G case is relatively benign and entertaining, as we, we've seen compared to the more recent developments. 
in the JNU case, after the release of Kanheya Kumar, posters emerged in central Delhi offering a reward of 11 lakhs to anyone who would kill Kanheya and a 5 lakh reward for anyone who could cut off his tongue. And all of this, interestingly, takes place in the name of love of one's country, which is not entirely surprising since the law of sedition under section 124A of the Indian Penal Code criminalizes any speech that tends to excite disaffection. So we would not be entirely often describing sedition as a kind of an enforcement of a mandatory affection or a duty to love the state. So after spending three weeks in jail, Kanheya Kumar finally got his bail, but also a free lesson on love, illness, and antibiotics. Mm. The substantive legal question in the bail order was whether or not there is a prima facie case that has been made and whether bail ought to therefore be given. On a factual determination, the order arrives at the conclusion that there was no prima facie case of sedition that's been established. And in fact, it also you know, gestures to the fact that a lot of the evidence itself had been doctored. But this, continuing with this overlap between law and cinema, the order begins with a verse from a song called Mere Desh Ki Dharti, which is from a 1967 uh, film called Upkar, described by the filmmaker Manoj Kumar as the 16,000 foot long celluloid flag of India. In these judgments, law seems to be produced at a liminal zone between legal reason and popular opinion. And thus liminality, this liminality allows for a jurisprudential shape shifting such that the bail order effectively becomes a gag order. The conditions for the bail become a pedagogic track to reform the errant schoolboy. The order effectively presumes the guilt of Kanahir Kumar by including a condition that he will not engage in any anti-national activity on being released. And I quote from the operative part of the order. The investigation in this case is at a nascent stage. The thoughts reflected in the <coughs> students raised by some of the students of JNU who organized and participated in that program cannot be claimed to be protected as a fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression. I consider this as a kind of infection from which certain students are suffering, which needs to be controlled or cured before it becomes an epidemic. Whenever some infection is spread in a limb, effort is made to cure the same by giving antibiotics orally. And if that does not work, by following a second line of treatment. Sometimes it may require surgical intervention also. However, if the infection results in infecting the limb to the extent that it becomes gangrene, amputation is the only treatment. At one level, this surplus is not entirely surprising. Judges are not immune to popular media. And the media trial in this case had already convicted, framed, and convicted him. So while news is supposed to report legal events, in many cases what we find is that it works through affective strategies that anticipate, exceed, and usurp the law. So to return to my point about the surplus of the judgment, in the Kanhaya case, given the intensity of public scrutiny, it was not surprising that this paragraph became the most discussed portion of the order. And its constant relay in media channels assumed for it the status in a way of a public broadcast. How did this situation come to be? I would suggest that one way of understanding this is by moving our timeline a little further back to understanding the roots of a judicial populism and its origins in India. Anuj Bhuwania in his forthcoming work on public interest litigation and the emergence of judicial sovereignty uses the term competing populism to characterize battles between the judiciary and pu other political institutions such as the executive. And there is no site better than public interest litigation to explore this tension, since by definition, PILs move through specific forms of publicness and politics as they find themselves articulated as legal problems. These cases also afford the judiciary an opportunity to indirectly address the public much as a prime minister or a news anchor would. If you look at the first phase, of PILs and of judicial populism, it begins in the 70s. And most of the great political battle in India from the 50s through the 70s were between the executive and the judiciary. The agonistic relationship between them was hinged around the question of who actually represented or spoke for the people. Lloyd and Su Suzanne Rudolph argue that on the one hand, the court's claim to represent the people via the constitution, which embodied the we of the we of the people. The government, on the other hand, claimed to speak with the authority of constitutional majorities or elected majorities in parliament based on the idea that elected you know, mandates express more directly the people's will 
They claim that courts were elite institutions which did not reflect the mandate of the people. This battle between the executive and the judiciary about who actually has access to something called the people reaches the Zenith under the leadership of Indira Gandhi, whose authoritarian and anti-democratic character was always masked by her claim to popular support. This brought her into conflict with the Supreme Court on a number of occasions, an institution that she, she sought to delegitimize by claiming that it had absolutely no representation of the people at all. One effect of this populist claim was an, a faith accompli that actually forced all her political opponents, whether they were political parties or the judiciary, to compete with her on her terms and make a counterclaim that they also represented the will of the people. As Shudipto Kaviraj suggests, the fiery opposition that Indira Gandhi faced from leaders like Jay Prakash Narayan were actually carried out in a language of populism, which was quintessentially <coughs> Indira Gandhi. Anuj Bhumania claims that this, that as a result of the crisis caused to the image of the Supreme Court during the emergency, uh, during the emergency, the court had basically capitulated <coughs> entirely uh, to Indira Gandhi's whims, and it seemed to be a very dark period in a way of judicial history in India. But this crisis <coughs> of the image of the Supreme Court and its independence during the emergency resulted in the post-emergency period in a certain kind of a populism and the birth of the public interest litigation, where it finds itself in a way again mimicking Indira Gandhi's populism. The question of mimicking becomes crucial for me when we move to the contemporary, but suffice it to say that this period establishes a template in which two conflicting authorities compete by mimicking each other in their claims to directly represent the interests of the people. The form of the PIL enables the court, in Anuj's words, to ventriloquize the people. Now, what does judicial populism and the PIL actually depend on? It depended on a number of factors. The assumption, for example, of an idea of an unmediated access to something called public interest, which in turn depends on access to the pulse of the people. Second, that the will of the people is supreme and prevails over any other value, since populism identifies the will of the people with justice and morality. And third, populism breeds an informalism which bypasses rules and procedure, <coughs> since these are dead weights obstructing the attainment of instant justice. And finally, populism invents a form of address that speaks directly to the public. If the classical fight that we've seen through the 70s of this competing populism has been the executive and the judiciary, I contend that what we are seeing emerging in the last decade or so is a new kind of sovereign authority, one that speaks in the name of the people, directly to the people, and is also the spokesperson for something called the people. It's not surprising that some of the shows on news channels even emulate a constitutional authority. So on NDTV, for example, you have a show called We the People, or some anchors adopt the subject position of a royal we when personally asking questions, claim that this is what the nation wants to know, right? So <coughs> India has the largest number of news channels in the world, and like many parts of the world, the competition for ad revenue has meant a downward slide of news and reportage to entertainment. Night after night, these anchors stage urgent dramaturgies of frenzied public interest, egging, for, egging guests to fight each other, accusing people, assessing evidence, and arriving at conclusive judgments. All the traditional functions of a court. The line between public interest and the interest of publicity gets blurred as these shows engage in producing what William Mazzarella describes as profitable provocations. Aditya Nigam, in a very powerful piece in Kafila a couple of days ago, says, Bloodlust has taken over the land. In this scenario, the hysterical television anchor takes on the role of a lynch mob instigator and the cheerleader combined into one. He exhorts while the lynch mob runs amok, threatening, attacking, and demanding that all anti-nationals, students, teachers, and intellectuals in general be shot, killed, or sent to Pakistan. The 24-hour news channel has totally redefined our ideas of liveness, publicity, and participation. <coughs> Unmodest in their self-assessment, Rajdeep Sardesai, a leading anchor, once suggested that had the Ram Janam Bhumi movement unfolded in the age of 24-hour television, the Babri Masjid would not have been demolished in 1992. A few years ago, when the Delhi High Court, uh, when the Delhi Court uh, trial court acquitted men accused of murdering a model Jessica Lal, NDTV launched a campaign called Save Jessica Lal, and the network ran a petition campaign via SMSs. <coughs> 
to which they received close to a quarter million messages. The Delhi High Court responded to this directly, ultimately overturning the previous verdict after fast-track fast proceedings and holding daily hearings. Interestingly, even as the media begins to take in a way judicial functions on, the manner in which these news channels obtain their populist power is in turn by mimicking the courtroom and the structure of the trial. Many of the early innovators of what would become a frenzied form of address did so by relying on the format of a live trial with the anchors negotiating between indignation and immediate justice. One of the earliest such programs was Rajat Sharma's Janta Ki Adalat or the People's Court. The program started with a formal pronouncement of a charge. Today in the People's Court you are charged with etc. etc. There was a people's judge who would pronounce judgment at the end of the program and more often than not justice would be served. These mock trials rapidly became the templates formally incorporated into news reportage and opinion shows. And what is striking is the manner in which news initially borrows its legal authority, uh, an authority, authority that it does not actually have, by mimicking of the court structure. And finally, usurping that power to institute a distorted and corrupt trial by media system with disastrous consequences, <coughs> which the courts then have to compete with. Right? So if in the first phase of judici judicial populism, the currency of competing populism was piety mm -hmm. and access to the suffering of the people, in this new phase, it's heightened affect and breathless indignation that serves as a direct measure of public interest. In her reading of the charged debates in popular media around <coughs> patriotism, Lauren Belland argues that justice in television often becomes a visceral reaction of individuals. And public debate takes the form of a disagreement where transparent feelings become a barometer of truth. The idea of a charged debate is a good indication of what is at play. John Jervis traces the link between the language of electricity and that of physical affect, observing the overlap between the psychic language of nerves and nervousness with that of electrical and electromagnetic energy, suggesting an indispensable connection between sensory experiences and the intensity of media sensationalism. His argument linking the history of sensation to affect is relatively familiar, but his importance for me lies in the moral consequences that he identifies. He claims that in the era of sensational media, we run the risk of an aesthetic short circuiting, the aesthetic sense short circuiting the moral one, with the danger that a sympathetic engagement with issues may no longer be possible. And there is, of course, no greater sight than nationalism and patriotism, in which this heady mix of media, sensation, indignation, anger, and the law come together. The idea of a charged debate, producing a transparent and unmediated access to truth, is possibly one of the greatest dangers of our time. If one of the desirable roles of the judiciary is that of a counter-majoritarian institution, and the idea of judicial freedom is based on its ability to support unpopular opinions, what happens when the court and judges are no longer outsiders too? but participate, participants in the affective economy of populism. How does an excessive duty to love radically alter the landscape of political freedom? And how may the history of competing populism and mimicry alert us to the dangers of a renewed judicial commitment to loving the nation? Do we run the danger of, seeking, of seeing a judicial backlash against its own rich history of upholding dissent and supporting unpopular opinions? Wendy Brown, since she is not here, I'm going to invoke her, her spirit, uh, in a sharp psychoanalytical reading of ultranationalism, signals the dangers posed to public discourse by the extreme idealization of the nation state as an object of love. And there are three consequences that, that Brown identifies which we can see echoed in the current debate in JNU. The first, nuance becomes the enemy of moral certainty. And the dissenter is in fact someone whose deliberate refusal to acknowledge the moral and emotional clarities of a good citizen marks him as a dangerous and corrupting force. Second, any criticism of the, of, of the undying devotion is not just dangerous, it's also contagiously so, threatening both the identification and idealization that binds the nation. So if you look at the bail order and the language of infection, much of it inherits from a much older history of a germophobia where the metaphor of the body relays anxieties about attacks on the body politic. And finally, the linking of domestic dissent with the enemy blurs the line such that wars are declared against dissenters who are the worst enemies 
because they're traitors. So what I've done so far is given you a rather bleak diagnosis. And now we turn to the good old Lenin question, what is to be done? In 2012, I contributed at that point of time when the government had just been sworn in to an efflux issue on ultranationalism. And it was a somewhat melancholic piece, asking for silence and a quiet withdrawal from the shrillness of ultranationalism. But in light of two de developments which I will now speak about, I'm a little less melancholic. And I believe that an ethics of betrayal and an aesthetics of silence may still be our strong allies. But before I revisit that argument, let me turn to the famous words of a dissenter spoken not very far from where we are. In 1964, just before the final sit-in of the free speech movement on December uh, 2nd, Mario Savio gave a speech outside Sproul Hall in which he said, that brings me to the second mode of civil disobedience. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at the heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies up upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. While Savio was pitting speech against silence and truth against power, his invocation of a machine so odious that you can't take part anymore is more relevant than ever before. When the media machine has become a war machine, what kind of conscientious objectors will we need to make it stop working? What kind of bodies will we have to put upon the gears, the wheels, the levers, and the apparatus to make it stop? In the last three weeks in India, even as the media machine ran out of control and worked breathlessly, oiled by anger and indignation, to produce a relentless barrage of hatred and violence, there were two key moments in which we saw the machine breaking down or being temporarily halted. On February 19th, Ravish Kumar from NDTV India blacked out the screen of his primetime broadcast, filling it only with, his, with text and his voice for 45 minutes, unprecedented in the history of television in India. And it's worth listening to a few excerpts from that day. I quote from the translation done by Imran Qureshi of Ravish's speech. And for those of you uh, who didn't watch it, this is basically what happened to television. It was entirely blanked out. There were just a couple of, you know, like texts that emerged, and you could hear him speaking. Ravi says, <clears throat> you all know that your TV has fallen ill. In the entire world, TV has developed TB. Mm -hmm. We are all ill. I am not saying others are ill, so I can play doctor. I am also ill. First, we became sick. Now you are becoming sick. Every day, some of you write letters threatening to either beat us up or set us on fire. Are we responsible for delivering that poison to you when in reality the poison is within us? This is why I want to take you into the dark world of TV so that you alone can listen to the noise and understand the hopes and fears that a group of anchors give birth to every day. We anchors are one amongst many. We anchors shout threateningly. When we speak, our veins get pronounced. And watching us makes your blood boil. A war of perceptions is on. Information is missing. And even if it is there, it says very little and prevents us from thinking in different ways. When we watch TV, anchors egging people on and urging them to scream at each other, let's pause and think. Do you shout when you talk to your wife or your friend? Does your father shout in a similar manner at your mother? Why is it then that we accept it when anchors speak like this? The questions get hidden in the din, and no one is bothered about the answers. Beat him, beat him, catch him, catch him, is all, all that we hear. Our TV anchors have become the spokesperson for nationalism. You're either a nationalist or a traitor. The sacrifice by soldiers is being politicized, and in their name, people are being called traitors. Martyrdom is the highest sacrifice in our country. But is the political exploitation of martyrdom the highest deed? The way that journalists name traitors in the name of nationalism is scary. My only aim is to caution. Listen to this. Listen to this carefully. Feel these words as you listen to them. When you listen to them, please note when your blood boils. When do you get excited? You have to keep in mind that none of the facts have been proven till now. These are merely the excerpts of a very long, very thoughtful, and extremely powerful 45 minutes of primetime television. 
The broadcast, to my mind, was a brilliant act of journalistic subversion. While it reiterated what many people already knew about the nature of television, the fact that it did so from within the medium on prime time, watched by millions of people, to my mind, made it an immensely significant act, but also an act which I would term as an ethical act of betrayal, since it disavows its own legitimacy. And this is perhaps what we need to think about. If the binaries of progressive and regressive, left and right, divides the world into patriots and unworthy traitors, I'm not too optimistic about whether dissenting bodies, very often like ours, standing with our peace flag before the advancing tanks, makes too much of a difference to the cynical media industry, with a few exceptions, of course. Our hope, then, might lie, instead, with conscientious, conscientious objectors like Ravish Kumar, who are not just inside the machine, but are its gears, its wheels, its levers, and its apparatus. The media war machine needs more conscientious voices of dissent. I know I'm saying this word wrong somehow. Uh, <clears throat> that betrays it from within, exposing its state secrets and corroding its sovereignty. If Ravish was a traitor to his medium by virtue of his message, then in another unparalleled act of solidarity and friendship, we saw the resignation of three ABVP members. The ABVP is the student wing of the BJP. These students, some of whom held key posts within the ABVP, in their resignation letter expressed a deep disappointment as well as disgust at the instrumental manner in which the discourse of anti-nationalism was being used by politicians and the media to tarnish an entire university. In their letter, they identify JNU as a space in which sharp ideological differences are nurtured through an ethos of democratic disagreement. After their resignation letter went viral, another member of the ABVP and a JNU alumni, Tanmaya Nanda, wrote a newspaper article in which he tried to explain the action of the dissenting ABVP members. Describing JNU as a place in which the work of everyday living and friendship transcends the deep ideological difference that exists between the students, Nanda narrates an incident in which he had contracted chickenpox and his roommate, a fellow ABVP member, had fled out of fear. But his friend, an ideological enemy from the left, moved into his room to take care of him. And he concludes, at this time, then when Kanheya Kumar is being perse persecuted for sedition, and all of JNU is being labeled as a hotbed of anti-nationals. We must applaud the action of these ABVP members who have broken ranks with their party to stand up for what this institution is about and, ag and against the government's overreaction. Nanda appropriately titled his article, Friendship Above Ideology. In making public their affection for their friends and their disaffection with the government, the students had suddenly made themselves vulnerable in a manner which is very similar to what everyone else who faces the wrath of the mob feels. These students have now been facing threats for their act of betrayal, with warnings being issued to them that they may be safe as long as they're within JNU, but what happens once you step outside? This language of the threat of stepping outside is no coincidence, since what is betrayal <coughs> if not stepping outside of one's skin, one's political affiliation, race, or one's put, you know, patriotic fealties. Might this then be another kind of surplus that we look towards and appeal to in our collective struggles against the false choices of ultranationalism? A surplus of, a, of affection of another kind, a friendship that defies ideology, thereby running the risk of placing oneself in the vulnerable shoes of another. Leela Gandhi, in her marvelous account of the radical politics of friendship, describes an incident in Australia where a woman was driving to a refugee detention center with a placard which said, you're not alone, to show her solidarity with those inside. But long before she could even raise her slogans, she was arrested and detained. But in that single moment, she herself became an alien, subject, as aliens are, to the crushing might of the state. And this prompts Leela Gandhi to ask, how are we to understand this relatively insignificant act, this minor self-endangerment for another, one that nonetheless produces a surplus of sociality and love. She chooses to call it the politics of friendship. In affective communities, Leela Gandhi brings together these two threads that I'm interested in, the surplus of friendship and the ethics of betrayal. Following the career of various European dissenters and traitors, like C.F. Andrews, Mahatma Gandhi's trusted friend and secretary, who participated in the anti-colonial movement, she gives us an image of sedition 
not as a collective political act, but as a series of individual acts and moral refusals, which undermine the myth of consistent uniform holes, the sustaining fantasy of ultranationalism. When Ravish Kumar asks whether we shout when we talk to our friends, he's asking for a retur return to a, to a gentle civility, the word that I just started associated with Maharaj Kaul, that betrays the hate-mongering ambitions of the media. When the ABVP students refuse to be a part of a political community that they've always identified with and choose friendship instead, their choice is also a scandal for the ultranationalists. Finally, Lila Gadi concludes, if friendship already inhabits the heart of the political, might we not in some fugitive night of thought smuggle in its place a radical substitute, <clears throat> an infiltrator who might unwork the logic of political similitude, give us an anti-communitarian community. If the call of radical politics is always a call to action and a demand for a response, how do we situate the refusal to stand up and the refusal to be counted in a collective as the performance of a non-representative individual? Jacques Rancière has suggested that perhaps the truly dangerous classes are not so much those that make up a collective with their clear sense of commonality, class, race, etc., but those who refuse to be collapsed within any collective, whether dominant or opposition. And while Leela Gandhi writes about her great-grandfather's friendship with C.F. Andrews, there is another friendship that he had, not a literal, but a philosophical one, with Henry David Thoreau. And in the spirit of a, you know, kind of a transnational dialogue, I'd like to try to think about what this may mean. Thoreau once said that his thoughts are murder to the state and involuntarily go plotting against her. At the same time, in his essay on civil disobedience, Thoreau said that he wanted to be a bad subject, but a good neighbor. In 2013, I met my own version of Thoreau on a trip to Sri Lanka. On a trip to Poswa Jaffna to meet activists and scholars, I was introduced to Jagdishan, known to many in the community as the philosopher, who lived in a very, very remote village in Jaffna. The philosopher was once a part of the LTTE, and he was arrested by the Singhala government, uh, detained and tortured for a number of years. After he was released, he was arrested by the LTTE, who was afraid that, they had that he had betrayed them. After his release by the LTT, he withdrew from political life, choosing to live in isolation. When I asked him what he felt about the post-war situation uh, and, in, and the mounting Sinhala kind of chauvinism spurred on by the victory of the ultranationalists, he replied that he had no idea, since he rarely talked to people any longer. Gesturing to the trees in front of his house, he said that he now only spoke to trees, and he shared his jokes with them, since people did not even understand jokes anymore. If people no longer understand jokes, he said, it was clear that the world was going mad and there was no hope left. He indicated that he was less interested in political affairs of the world around him and more attracted to forms of spiritual practice, even as he gave detailed instructions to someone on how to repair a water pump. He used to be an engineer before. His helpfulness to his neighbors and his comfort with technical matters seemed to belie the claim that he had entirely withdrawn from the social. And yet at the same time, his melancholic disposition seemed to indicate a form of inhabiting the world as an act of mourning for it, in Vina Das's terms, which in his case required his, to, his turning away from it. Jagadishan's withdrawal from society and his loss of hope could be interpreted as a form of apolitical ascetic withdrawal into the domain of the spiritual. But if we return to Jagadishan via Thoreau, we see many resonances. In contrast to accounts that sees Thoreau's withdrawal into the woods to write Walden as an apolitical act, there are scholars like Shannon Mariotti who focus on how withdrawal from public life may itself be the basis for rethinking the political. It's often assumed that de democracy cannot thrive if citizens withdraw from public spaces. But how are we to find our expressions for our deepest disagreements with the very content of democratic politics when the extreme validation of prejudice and hatred is what we find constantly being relayed to us. Thoreau's retreat into nature, Mariotti suggests, was not a retreat from the political as much as an immersion into a form of life that allowed for the cultivation of one's true nature as a means to understand and activate the basis of a democracy. And if ultranationalism is charged with an affective immediacy and breathless exuberance, what Thoreau and Jagdishan share is a melancholic relation to the present, but a melancholia based not on a mythical idea of an idealized past that has been lost, but instead of a mourning for an alternative future that the present does not allow to pass through. 
Their respective withdrawals, to my, uh, my mind, are a kind of an experimentation with a former self that rejects any pragmatic or realist usurpation of the political horizons of the self. And in that sense, it would be a mistake to read either of them in purely personal terms, since their responses or, and their withdrawals are a response to the state of politics as we currently know it, as well as an attempt to redefine a political community that includes trees and neighbors. The temporal distance of one and the spatial proximity of the other are anathema to the national imagination of time and boundaries. If in Thoreau we find a seditious imagination that simultaneously speaks the language of affection and disaffection, murderous thoughts which nonetheless produce a civic friendship. And if sedition runs the risk of the subject being cast out of the sphere of the citizen, withdrawal runs another risk of being cast out of the domain of the political itself. But it's precisely the potential of these non-political realms, or traditionally non-political realms, of, of, of betrayal by Ravish Kumar and of kind of friendship by the ABBP uh, members that we need to turn our attention to. Specific practices such as walking in Thoro or picking berries seems to, in a way, articulate a sense of affection that moves from the natural world to the social world and back. And for me to love a particular mountain or stream is not to love the motherland or fatherland in an abstract sense. It is instead a mode of passionate habitation, where in fact, which in fact often runs contrary to the imagination of national interests as witnessed by the struggles of indigenous people across the world against development projects. A few years ago, when the state of Himachal Pradesh was attempting to acquire land for a skiing resort, a 90-year-old man objected to his land being acquired. He said that he did not see an urgency of moving from where he was. On being asked why, because the compensation was very good, he explained that the dhoop or the warm sunlight that he was accustomed to and very fond of in the patch where he sat every day for 20 years would disappear from his life. Yeah. And he was not keen to lose it. Yeah. It's no surprise that the root word for the word fond comes from the word ground. And there can perhaps be no common ground on which we stand, no collective ideal that we can imagine if it's not founded on a gentle idea of affection of this kind. This is the form of passionate dwelling that we need to retreat to if we are to truly withdraw from the hyperbolic clarion call of nationalism. If the excess of ultranationalism demands that we stand whenever the national anthem is played, or that we cheer in the loudest voice every act of triumphant chest beating or chest measurement, it may well be time for us to continue sitting where we are, precisely because we love the ground that we sit on, and to do so quietly, since sedition sometimes speaks in whispers. In conclusion, let me turn via the words of George Steiner to what it may mean to step outside, to walk, to withdraw, and to, dis to discover a new, another political nature. Steiner says, trees have roots. Human beings have legs with which to visit, to dwell amongst the rest of mankind as guests. I would want to think of these visitors as the truly human beings that we must try to become if we are to survive at all. Intrusion may be our only calling, so as to suggest to our fellow men and women at large that all human beings must learn how to live as each other's guests in life. There is no society, no religion, no city, no village which is not worth improving. By the same token, there is none not worth leaving when injustice or barbarism takes charge. Morality must always have its bags packed. Thank you.